Good morning, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Happy Sunday to everybody. Uh, welcome to another edition of Ranking the Albums. Today, we got in the co-captain's chair once again, Mr. Rich Catino. Morning, everybody. Good morning, my friend. How are you today? Doing good. Doing good. Looking forward to talking to a little, to, talking to, not talking, see, it's the morning. Yeah. Talking a little bit about Extreme. There we go. Uh, a band that has been asked for a lot here on the channel by our viewers. So uh, as soon as I found out Rich was a fan, I said, all right, there's my partner. There's my dance partner for this one. So uh, we only got five studio albums. So not, uh, not a lot here as far as, but um, you know, and as far as massive albums, but, uh, and really when you think about it, a really short recording period before the big long hiatus. Right. So uh, one of those bands that I think um, had that moment in the, in the sun yeah. Uh, due to a couple songs that really weren't representative of what they actually did. And for some reason, they just never kind of came back from that. Uh, which yeah. Is really, and, you know, you listen to this band, uh, should have been superstars, I think. And I think they were very brief. On some level. Yeah, they were. Yeah. yeah. On some level. yeah. But, but, they, but they were superstars not for what they really did well, I think. Right, right. Because I remember seeing uh, Mother Don't Want to Go to School, Little Girls, and Kid Ego on Headbangers Ball before you know they were playing more than words and wholehearted and then everybody thought that they were more about that but if you were watching headbangers ball you know you knew that they were more of a hard rock metal edge band yeah yeah and i think a lot of the people who just got got into them and bought the record just because of more than words were then kind of like oh the rest of this is kind of different it's like well yeah yeah that's that's who they are right <laughs> no, i think that's the problem with most of the, the bands from the 80s and the early 90s the hard rock as I call them, the hard rock metal bands. I don't call them hair bands or, I mean, of course there's glam bands because they're, they were dressed up, they were glammy, it's obvious. Yeah. They were making the lips and all the other stuff. But I'm talking about musically, sound wise, it's hard rock metal. So yeah. all those bands that fell into that category had a lot of that same problem. Yeah, they had this stuff. one big ballad hit, right? Which is, and the Mr. Big had the same, exact same thing happen to Mr. Big, big right? Yeah. 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 So, they all right, so we're, uh, we've got five albums here, so we're going to work our way back from our least favorite to our favorite. I'm going to have Rich kick us off with his number five. I'm going with Waiting for the Punchline from 95. I'm not a fan of this album, really. I never go, I actually never go back to it. It's totally a sign of the times for them, trying to keep up with the times. It's alternative, grungy, um, it's got a little bit of a, a Zeppelin feel in parts of it, I think. Like when I was listening to it again, I think uh, the song Shadow Boxing is very Zeppelin-y. Um, but the whole album, even the way it kicks off with There Is No God, it's just dingy and grungy and it doesn't have that spunk and the punch and Nuno's guitar tone is not what it was. Uh, it's lost all those big harmonies and melodies that they did in the vocals. It's, it's just... Uh, a step in the wrong direction and i think it's a, a product of the 90s i think yeah uh well I'll, I'll talk more about that in a minute um I, I think the production on that album is like really awful yeah <laughs> and i don't think it did him any favors i'll go more in detail on that but uh yeah i i you know i can't say i disagree much with that um right. it's it's i think an album that could have been a lot better uh, you know before I, i'm not going to get too much into it now because i want to kind of talk more at length about it but yeah I, I mean obviously that's the album that kind of like stalled them for so many years i mean and then uh yeah you know you had uh, gary going over to uh to van halen which van. i mean that should have been a match made in heaven right it should have because he's a, such a great i mean god he's arguably the best singer that was ever in that band right love arguably. Him. I mean, he, yeah, he's the best singer for the, the band, but album-wise, it's terrible. Oh, the album is, yeah, yeah. And it's not his fault. It's just a shitty album. It's yeah. not, it didn't work. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that should have been a great pairing between, you know, yeah. the guys in Van Halen and him, and it was just a right. complete disaster, unfortunately. But again, uh, that album, another sign of the times. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep, yep, absolutely. I'm going to go with... Uh, Saudades de Rock is my number five from 2008. I think it's a really solid record. Um, it's got some, it, I think the production's better on that album. It sounds more like an extreme album. Uh, Comfortably Dumb is a really great song. Last Hour is excellent. Flower Man, Ghost. Uh, it, it, it's a really long album. And I, I, I talk about this a lot. I think a lot of bands like in the modern era are putting out these like 65, 70 minute long albums and a yeah. lot of songs. Or and I think... 
Yeah, I mean a lot. Yeah, a lot of material on here, and but I think there's a lot of really cool riffs. Uh, Nuno sounds spectacular on here. His soloing is great. Uh, mm -hmm. I just find that the songs on this album are not quite as memorable as some of the stuff from the earlier albums. But I think it's a, a really solid record, and it was a good comeback for them. Uh, yeah. And we haven't heard anything that was 12 years ago already. Right, right. Jeez, and what's have, going on? I have seen news in the past couple of years that they are working on another album. So it should be hopefully coming out. Is it too late? To, is it too late, though? You know, it's like too little, too late. I don't know. It's, it's, it's hard when you got a band like this who is going so long in between records. I mean, on, on, yeah. other than the hardcore fans, you know, does anybody yeah. care anymore? Which is sad because this is a really good band. I know. I know. It's true. <clears throat> All right. You're number four. I'm going with that one. <laughs> How do you say it? So, so, I guess a Sodades, Sodades de Rock, I guess. I don't know. Something That's like my that. favorite. Um, yeah, it was a step in the right direction. Like Star is, is cool. It's definitely a traditional extreme arrangement. Uh, comfortably Dumb is okay. Uh, take Us Alive. Um, did you mention Flower Man? Yeah. Didn't like that one. That's the one that sounds like a Green Day song. Oh, I know. it's kind of catchy though. I don't know. I, th I think, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I don't like Green Day, but I, I kind of like Dick yeah. Flower Man. I hate Green Day. When I went back to revisit the album, I was like, ooh, this sounds like Green Day. I can't dig this. <laughs> <laughs> um ghost is kind of cool that's the ballad right the acoustic yeah 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 that's a nice song too um slides pretty good interface so it, it is a little bit more back on track for them not quite there but it, it's got its moments and it's still pretty enjoyable i think it's still it's just missing the first two albums that punch the balls the metal edge riffs you know the hard rock riffs yeah. and the the bottom end and the, the crunch and the punch, it's missing all that. They never they never quite recaptured the uh, kind of that, that exactly what you're talking about. There was there was a both those first two albums have this production to them that man it's just yeah. like it's huge. They yes. never quite recaptured that. Right. No. And and that's one of the things now I'll go to my number four, which is waiting for the punchline from ninety five. I personally think that there's a lot of really good songs on this album. And it's it's really moody, uh, it is. So, right? I mean, and I think they're trying to get really experimental, and I, you know, it's in the middle of yeah. you know grunge and alternative, and there's there's little yeah. bits of that. But I mean, I a lot of the songs I hear classic extreme on, but man, the production is just dry yeah. and lifeless. I mean, like Price, his yeah, totally new, down. big time, right? And I think that ruins the album because I think songs like. Uh, you know, there is no God. Cynical is a great song. Uh, Hip today, I love. Uh, you okay. got the blues. Naked is really good. Uh, Leave me alone. No respect. No respect is really cool. It's angry. Evangelist is good. Fair weather faith. Uh, I think I like the maturity of the songwriting on the album, mm -hmm. but man, that flat, dry production just doesn't do it any favors. I, I think it's kind of an underrated album that is really yeah. ruined by the production. It just it doesn't sound like an extreme album. But you, you yeah, listen no, to the songs, and it's like, yeah, that that I like this. I like the song. I like the hook. The guitarists yeah. are cool, but man, it just sounds like flat and lifeless. I think you put uh, porno graffiti style production on that album. I think people would think a lot different of. Maybe, yeah. That's I don't know because the songs still feel like they're alternative and grungy as well. So I don't know the type of riffs that Nuno's doing. You know, it, I, I was know. trying to change it up a little bit and I can appreciate yeah. that. I just, I don't yeah. know. I, I dig a lot of the songs on there. I just, man, you listen to it. It's like, Oh God, this just sounds like shit. Right? Yeah, uh, it, does. it is very Zeppelin-y though. Like I thought it's, it's in, very in spots. Yeah. In spot. Well, yeah. they were trying to get a little more experimental. And I think, you know, with the third album, I think they were, you know, really working on more epic style arrangements. And I think they did a yeah. little bit of that. on waiting for the punchline, but it's more of a direct album. It's less kind of pompous and overblown like the third mm -hmm. album. And th th but that's right. a good thing. Um, so yeah, but uh, yes, yeah, that's my number four. I, I think, uh, and kind of an underrated album could have been a lot better, but man, it's just, it's not really pleasing to listen to on the no. ears, right? So. No. I don't even know, it's not even in my CD collection. I had it, I, I, I know I had it. I, I must have gotten rid of it. I don't know. Who knows I got rid of it. <laughs> yeah, who knows, I don't know. It's, it's a long time ago. Yeah, don't need it. All right, back to you for number three. Three, going with three sides. Oddly enough, three sides to every story. Um, I really dig this album. I thought it was very cool. Talking about, you know, variety in a varied album. It's like, um, it would be like their Queen album. And they're very influenced by Queen. Yeah. But that's what makes it so great. Um, it's got the 
the harder rock songs on it, like Warheads, um, Color Me Blind, uh, Cupid's Dead. But you also got like Rest in Peace, which is a little more, I don't know, what would you call it? It's not quite the funky side of Extreme. It's something else. It's just like a regular straight ahead rock song. It's, I mean, a lot of the stuff on this album is just straight ahead hard rock. I mean, I think they, they yeah. laid off a little bit of the funk on this album and they uh-huh. wanted to be, you know, they wanted to be an album band here, right? And this, you know, this, yeah. this whole kind of big bombastic epic concept album yeah. filled with lots of uh, pop hooks, yes. a lot of, you know, cool strings and things. I mean, this is a yeah. pretty oh, adventurous yeah. album. The, yeah, when you get to the, the truth part of it, when you got part one, two, and three. Yeah. And then... um what else? Uh, Tragic Comic was a really cool song. I really yeah. love Seven, Seven Sundays. Yeah. I think that's one of uh, one of Gary's best vocal performances ever. Yep. Man, it just shines on that song. It's it just screams Freddie Mercury, right? It does. Yeah. It does. So I really I enjoy this album. You know, you listen to it from the beginning to the end, and it's meant to be listened to that way. I think. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. Uh, was it the album the general public wanted at the time? Maybe not. Yeah, maybe not. It did, it did lose the, the balls and the muscle of the, the second album and the uh, guitars from the first album, but it still had some of that, you know, edge like on Warheads. Yeah. Open oh, that, there's, a, there's a few hard rockers on here. Yeah. yeah, yeah it, didn't totally, it didn't totally lose it. It didn't go and deviate into some other crazy direction. Yeah. It was like expansion of uh, porno graffiti, I thought. Yeah. Yeah, great album. We'll talk more yeah. about that in a couple minutes. Uh, I'm going to go with their debut at my number three. Uh, 1989's uh, really good album uh, you know basically that album and Porno Graffiti are not really that different from each other uh, really? I think I think Porno Graffiti is a little more mature yeah. but I think uh, I, I mean all this the extreme elements are on that first album right that kind of yeah. uh, loads of funky heavy guitar right a lot of the yeah. hooks I mean Kid Ego Little Girls Mother has just some absolutely amazing riffs and solos on I mean that's you listen to Mother uh, and you're like, all right, who is this guy, Nuno Betancourt? I want to yeah. hear more of him, right? Uh, oh, Teacher's yeah. Pet is great. Flesh and Blood is killer. Uh, mm-hmm. I think it's it's a great debut. And, uh, you know, might even rank higher for me, but I, the, the next two albums that come for me are their masterpieces, in my opinion. But I, I think it's a killer debut. Okay. Cool. I agree. Um, so that's coming in at my number two. Number two. Is the debut. Yes, my number two. Um, a lot of the same points you're saying. It's got those really great guitars, heavy hard rock guitars, a little bit of a metal edge to them. I really dug the Kid Ego song in the video. It had a lot of energy to it. Them yeah. jumping around and him swinging around and everything in the in the um, what was that? The big uh, look like a big empty um, warehouse or something, right? Yeah, yeah. There's two actually two versions of that video too. That song. Oh, really? Yeah, two different versions of that song, the way they cut it. I don't know. One's on the one that's the album version. The other one is like a remix or something. Um, but there's a couple songs on it that are kind of silly, too. Like, it, you can tell it's their their debut, and they're still kind of young, and they're still figuring it all out, like Rockabye Baby and Big Boys Don't Cry, Watching, Waiting. Eh. Yeah, well... I, it's a product of the times, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. which is fine. But little Girls, Wind Me Up, Kid Ego, Mother, Teacher's Pet, um, Play With Me is Nuno just going off. And yeah. when you see him live, he really tears that up when he plays that live. Um, Smoke Signals is eh, Flesh and Blood is okay. You know, it's, you know, like half really kick-ass, and then the other half is kind of um, uh, a little juvenile. Juvenile, a little naive, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, we, we often see that a lot of these younger bands on their first album, right? They're still trying to kind of figure it all out. And I think they usually right. by the second or third album, they kind of grow into their own skin. And that's absolutely, you know, same thing happened with Extreme. But I think, yeah. you know, that's a debut where even though maybe half the album is, you know, a little on the mediocre side, the other half is so good that you're like, wow, these guys right. have some serious talent, right? These guys are going to go places. And I think when we all first heard Extreme yeah. uh, on that debut, we knew some good stuff was was coming. And then the second album came, we're like, oh, there we go, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Yep. So uh, my number two is going to be Porno Graffiti from 90. Um, I Man, I listened to this a ton back so in the day. 
I mean, a ton. I mean, this, for me, this album was a nice escape from, you know, at the time, this is is 1990. So I was listening to a lot of thrash leading Uh up to this. Uh, I was, you know, really had enough of a lot of what we call the H-A-I-R bands, right? Uh, Because, you know, some of them to me just didn't have the musicality that was really grabbing me anymore. There was an an overload. Yeah. You know, definitely an overload. There's too many, there was too many, I think, of the the poisons, I would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, even though absolutely. poison, even though poison have their their time, their moments and their songs, I think, and they're a little underrated too, and a little uh, knocked much, you know, made fun of much, but they still have their moments. But I think a lot of those poisons and a lot of the the bands like Nitros and stuff like that it just got ridiculous. Yeah. And these guys were a breath of fresh air. I mean, because quite frankly, at the time, nobody was doing this kind of funk metal thing, really. Not like this, anyway. You know, you had Faith No More doing a little bit of it and, you know, a couple yeah. other acts. But there was yeah. something about, like, this fantastic lead singer who had this kind of, like, Freddie Mercury thing going on. This guitar player who can shred balls, right, but could lay down these great funky riffs, that tight rhythm section, and these addicting songs. It's just, like... Uh, they, for me, they were a breath of fresh air, and it's and I played it this a ton, and it's a fun album. It this is. Album is a lot of fun. It's a long album, but you know what? You don't mind it on here. It, you play right through it. Yeah, you go right through it. I mean, you know, they just grab you from decadence dance, which I mean, how about that riff? Yeah. Like, oh my god, so man, heavy, masterful. Brushes. Ah, you got yeah. Susie. Uh, Susie's awesome. Get the funk out is you know obviously was kind of the little first kind of big stab at attention from this album. Uh, he man, uh-huh. woman hater, amazing. Uh, the production of this album is just crushing. Yes, I mean yes. this this is the production that I wanted to hear on Waiting for the Punchline. Yeah, and you don't and you don't get it. Uh, yeah. The rhythm section just kills here. Yeah, I mean you just the groove of this of this album you just can't deny. And you gotta you know really give a lot of credit to the rhythm section. You know why it sounds so good? It's because it was produced by Michael Wagner. Well, there you have it, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> who's, who's put his magic touch on so many great albums from the 80s. So many. So many. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Gary Sharon is, this is like a star-making performance right here. Yeah. And uh, it's just a shame that, like, so many people, when you bring up Extreme, they really only know more than words and wholehearted. Uh, right. And just and never bought another thing by these guys. Um, it's it's almost yeah. like you know, but uh, a great album. And for me, if it wasn't for the one I'm going to talk about next, this would have definitely been my number one. Okay. Well, back to you for is, your number one, right? Which is <laughs> <laughs> that is my number one. It's it's flawless. I don't know what to say. There's nothing bad about it. And I love the way that they worked in the piano into their music. And it added such variety and dynamics to what they do without yeah. losing without losing the balls and the punch of the debut. Like and the acoustic song too, like Wholehearted and uh, More Than Words. I love Wholehearted. Nice Wholehearted is great. Yeah. Nice laid back jam. But then you got Song for Love and um, When I First Kiss You. It's brilliant. Like those piano pieces. Yeah. Like you could picture going to New York City and having dinner and having somebody sitting there playing that on the piano. Yeah. While you're eating dinner, that's how yep. perfect it is. And they gave you a glimpse of what was to come with songs like that. So exactly. you knew they you knew they had it in them. Whereas right. I think like the first album, you know, you got kind of a lot of the sleazy, funky stuff, right? And then this album, you have a lot of that, but then all yep. this other stuff that's like, wow, these guys yes. are actually really talented and in other sure. ways, right? Yeah, yeah, maturity definitely. Um, yeah. But it still has that edge and the balls and the punch from the debut, like when I'm president, Little Jack Horney. And the title track, and it's a monster. I mean, they yeah. still do it's a monster live all the time, and that's that's a monster. Yeah, but playing on that is forget uh, about it. off the charts. Yeah, you watch the new, you're just like, what the hell are you doing, dude? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he's another one of those guys who, if the if extreme kind of broke big five years before, uh. Uh-huh. Would a lot of people be talking to him as one of the greatest guitarists in the world? Like, you know, like on, on, and I'm not just talking about like amongst musicians and people who yeah. really follow this type of music. I'm talking about the general public. Like, you know, like mo- the general public, oh, best guitar player. Oh, yeah, Eddie Van Halen, Eric Clapton, Jeff Beck, Jimi right. Hendrix, you know, blah, blah, blah. Right. But you think if extreme, because I mean, the 90s was tough for bands like these. Yes. And, and it's like if he, if extreme would have came out a couple of years earlier and really hit it big in like 85, 86, 87, 88, 
88 and not yes. at the beginning of the 90s, mm. would Nuno Betancourt be like one of the major guys? We all, we all know he is talent-wise, right? right? Amongst, amongst our people, yes, we know it. <laughs> yes, yes. And would Gary Sharon be like one of those great vocalists of all time instead of like now, like, you know, what is he doing? Nobody knows, right? So, right. and that's a shame. That's a shame. It is. Yeah. It is. People, people undersell this band. And it's like that for many of these bands from this genre that yeah. still make great music. Like, I don't know if you're a fan of House of Lords. Oh, great band. Yeah. And their last six out, the new one, I'm not, it's okay. It's not up to par with the, the other ones, but the five albums before that are awesome. It's better than I think their first three. And the first three are really good. <laughs> yeah, they are. But they really, they really have, you know, stepped it up as well. And they kept, yeah. Their traditional sound, but they just added more guitars, made it a little more harder rock and a little more metal, and they're still making great music. So, all these bands, there's so many that just get sold sold short. Yeah. Because yeah. Because of their hit singles and their MTV videos. Yeah. I don't know. I, I we've talked about it so many times before, but it's it's so true. It's so I know. true. But it's like you know what? It was good for them back then. They made a lot of money off it back then, but had as as I hurt their career going forward all these years later. All right, my number one, obviously, no surprise here, Three Sides to Every Story from 1992. I will say, if, if we would have had this conversation back, you know, 25 years ago, it probably yeah. wouldn't have been my number one. It would have been Porno Graffiti. But for me, this album has really stood the test of time, and it's one that I've enjoyed even more as I've gotten older and as I've really kind of dive back into this and just realize it for the true kind of masterpiece that it really is. I mean, it's just it's a it's, piece of art. It's it really, really is. And it, yeah, it is. And you have to appreciate stuff like this. This is not, this album is not for everybody. And obviously by the kind of lackluster sales, it wasn't for the masses. And I get that. But if you kind of have an ear for more adventurous music, uh, that's really thoughtful, really melodic, um, you know, their fun, funky metal stuff is really not on here other than a handful of songs, right? It's just like you mentioned, it's a good hard rock album. It's actually a gorgeous pop album at times. Uh, it is. Very sophisticated, yeah. great yep. melodies. Uh, you mentioned Warhead, catchy, heavy, uh, rest in peace, ultra memorable. Cupid's Dead is kind of funky. It's got a little that weird rap stuff going on there, but it kind of works. Mm -hmm. uh, Political Calamity, right, is a killer yeah. song. Uh, I love Peacemaker Dies. Yes. That could have been a hit single. That, that should have been. been a hit single. Yes. Uh, you mentioned Seven Sundays. That's just like big operatic melodic queen. I mean, it's just That's, so good. Uh, his vocals, man. Uh, off the charts, great. Uh, yeah. Our Father, another really good memorable number with a soaring chorus. Uh, mm -hmm. Stop the World. Yep. It's like, it's like their Beatles song, right? I think they still do that, don't they sometimes? Uh, they might. It's a gorgeous song. I love it. Yeah. I, I know they it. do Warheads and Rest in Peace and I think Tragic Comic and maybe Stop the World sometimes comes in. Yeah, it could be. I love Stop the World. Uh, yeah. Don't Leave Me Alone. Another kind of queenish, even a little bit of ELO going on there. Uh, Am I Ever Gonna Change? It's this kind of moody, Zeppelin-y, big, you know, bombastic yeah. track. I just think it's a, it's a, it's a, a great achievement here. And probably yeah. for me, you know, when you talk about underrated albums, uh, this has got to be up there in the discussion, I think. When did that one come out? Uh, uh, this 92. was 92, yeah. Bad so, timing, really bad timing, I think. Yeah, yeah. There's, that, there's, I, I actually have a little list here. There's a whole bunch of these bands that put out an album around this time, between 90 and 95, that put out great albums before they tried to do another album later in the decade, and they really shit the bed. <laughs> so I'm just going to name a few of them here. Striper Against the Law. Europe, Prisoners in Paradise. Uh, White Lion, Main Attraction. Um, Great White, Psycho City. Tesla, Bust a Nut. Um, Bust a Nut Skid is a great album. Bust a Nut yeah. is really good. Yeah. Skid Row, Subhuman Race. Uh, Warrant, Dog Eat Dog. That's the best Warrant album. It's not Cherry Pie, but, <laughs> but it's still Warrant. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, Slaughter, Fear No Evil. That was a great album, too. And Winger, Paul. Oh, Winger that, is awesome. Winger, that needs a that needs its own show. Uh, let's do it. Because Winger poll is everything that needs to be corrected that everybody thought about with the first two albums. Yeah, I I never disliked Winger. Never did so, either. No. All right, so that's our next show together, right? There you go. 
I dig it. But that's yeah. that's the point of of these bands and that first part of the nineties, ninety to ninety five. You know, yeah. they still put yeah. out good music before like Warren tried like Ultraphobic or Dokken put out um what was that really bad album? Oh yeah. Um Functional, the one after that. Yeah. Where they yeah. Be new metal. Yeah, uh, that's not that's not good at all. Yeah. I think it's good that we don't remember the title. <laughs> I could I could picture the album cover right, and it's like, but I think I tried yes. to like remove yes. it from my mind, right? Because uh, yeah. they they did good ones after that, uh, yeah. but that one ish, exactly no good. Oh, yeah, there you go. All right, so there we have it. Uh, ranking the extreme catalog, five of them. Uh, everybody watching, rank them as you like them in the comments below. Curious to see what everybody comes up with here. Uh, remember, we all have our favorites, so there's no right or wrong answer here at all. I want to thank Rich Catino for coming back on the show once again. As you heard it here live, uh, the next show we'll be doing together is uh, Winger. So we'll be ranking the studio catalog of Winger. That'll probably be over the next week, week and a half or so. So stay tuned for that. In addition... Uh, as Rich and I discussed before we went on the air, Rich will be joining me on some Monsters Den episodes throughout October yes. to help promote horror films, sci-fi, well, you know, horror, suspense, monster movies, uh, classic ones. Uh, we'll be continuing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you want to tell them a little bit about that shirt? Because I was, I was uh, amazed at this. So This is uh, Varan. It was called Varan the Unbelievable. Yep. What a terrible title. <laughs> yeah. But it was... Uh, a black and white monster movie around the same time as Godzilla. I think it was 58, maybe? Yeah, somewhere. I think it came out right after Rodan, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. yeah. I think so it was before it was Rodan. Was it before color. Rodan? So it was between the yeah, first Godzilla Rodan. and Rodan? Okay. I think so. Rodan was color. But uh, just an underrated monster that only did one feature movie and then was in a cameo in Destroy All Monsters. Yep. It yep. Just fell off, the, fell off the map. But a real cool design and a lot of potential and Toho didn't do much with them. No. And you know, that's another one of those films where they, uh, they did an American version of the film that just completely ruined. It. Yeah. They chopped uh, it up. It was a mess. Awful. Added, added in like an American actor and it just, uh, just yeah. doesn't make any sense at all. But if you watch the original, it's very creepy and moody. Yeah. Like the original Godzilla. Yep. Yeah. And the yeah. monster's very cool and you could see its potential and what they could have done with it. But Absolutely. But they didn't do anything with them after that. Yeah. So, uh, so look for Rich on some Monsters Den episodes coming up throughout October as we'll be doing a bunch yeah, of those. Awesome. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, so stay tuned for all that. This is on the web at www.catranquility.org. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube all the damn time. If you like what you see, please click on the Ko-Fi or Ko-Fi link below in the album description. Uh, buy us a coffee, a tea, a pint of beer, a cassette, a eight track, you know, whatever the hell you like. We also got uh, the merch shop up linked to that with all our new t-shirts and things like that. That's so a very cool out. shirt, by the way. Thank you that. so much. Yep. The brand new, it's in the shop right now. So uh, brand new design. So we got the, the old design and the new design. Rich, you want to plug uh, a couple links for everybody? Uh, Metalasylum.net, which I always write for. Great words I always write for. Uh, the Metal Hall of Fame I contribute to. Um, Am I Evil? graphic novel which we're working on and doing your show every once in a while which has become a thing now which is great i love it absolutely we love having you on here so uh, and, uh hopefully everybody learns from this episode too about extreme and all these other bands i think that's what people need to kind of educate themselves on a little bit you know yeah that's what about it's all about about what they're about and not just about hit singles yep they're more or, than or the one big album right yeah exactly exactly you got to look into the whole catalog or the whole album itself not just the singles absolutely cool yeah. so there you have it everybody uh have a good rest of your weekend enjoy and we'll see you real Thanks, soon guys. for rich catino i'm pete pardo have a good one everybody thanks for having me